Welcome back, guys, to another episode of Not Just Football with your host, me, Cam Hayward. I'm looking forward to this episode. We got a great show today. We got Pro Bowler, two-time Super Bowl champ, and more importantly, my mentor, Steelers legend, Brett Kiesel, is joining us today. But first, I need to address the Bleacher Report claims that I have a problem with other teams' black helmets. Yeah, I do have a problem because... We talk so much about being creative and having all these different things going on with the jerseys and, you know, you got your color rushes, you've got your alternate unis, but when you come to a helmet and it's a black helmet, you know the original black helmets. You know what time it is when you see the Steelers black helmet. You know what time it is when you see the Baltimore Ravens black helmet, the Falcons black helmet, even the Jacksonville Jaguars black helmet. Those are staples in our league. And now we have a copycat league because everybody's trying to get back to it. Hayden, what do you think? I'm just shocked you care this much about the helmets. I mean, it's never seen you care this much about fashion in your life. And you're really passionate about this. And I got the Bleacher Report art notification and couldn't believe you were in the middle of controversy. Yeah, because it's getting – it's a slow time. We haven't started camp. It's Monday right before camp starts for a lot of teams. And I see this headline that Hayward has a problem with the black helmets. And I'm like, I ain't really have a problem with it, but it was just, nobody has anything to talk about. And I'm scrolling through and I just keep seeing the same thing over and over again. Everybody wants to talk about, ooh, we got black helmets. Even the Jets got a black helmet now, which is kind of cool. But there are some teams that have no reason having a black helmet. Like who? Who who don't you want to have a black helmet? Like why do you care so much about this? I don't know if there's one team in particular, but I think when every team, you know, releases their second helmet, like is it really saying that much when everybody's getting a black helmet? Should we just call this the black helmet realm? Like are we just getting used to everybody having a black helmet? Like I wish the Steelers would go ahead and bring back the yellow helmets. I have mine downstairs in my basement right now and like when I put that we we would only wear it for a couple days in camp, and then maybe two games during the year. But everybody loved when you wore the yellow helmets. And, you know, it stood out. It was so such a big contrast from the, from the norm where we had our black helmets, which are awesome, but everybody knew those yellow helmets stood out. What do you think about the Bengals' white one, though? I actually thought that looked pretty smooth when I saw it. Yeah, I got to give the Bengals some credit. They actually did right with their helmets. You know, to see the white bangle helmet, that's just, you know, you think of like a, a Siberian, Siberian tiger when you see those helmets. It's, it's, a, it's a cool little trendy thing they do, um, and it, it should work pretty well with their helmets. It, the fact that this all stemmed from a black helmet argument is what bothered you so much. Like I said, it's one of your lamest tweets I've ever seen, and the fact that Bleacher Report picked it up and ran with it was so funny <laughs> because I'm like, this, he said nothing here. He didn't say yeah. anything. It's slow. Everybody's just waiting for LeBron and Kyrie to hook up or where Katie's ending up um, and then trying to figure out where Deshaun Watson's going to end up. So, Hayden, you know, I know it's a slow week. What's happening around the league? Your former Hall of Fame quarterback, Ben Roethlisberger, did an interview this past week where he made some statements that I kind of want to get your opinion on. And I'll read a little bit here. He said, I might be standing on a soapbox a little bit. but That's my biggest takeaway from when I first started to the end. It turned from a team first to a me type attitude, it was hard. It was hard for these young guys too. Social media, they're treated so well in college. Now the new NIL stuff, which is unbelievable. They're treated so special. They're coddled at a young age because of college coaches needed them to win. So where do you stand on that as a guy who's played with Ben for almost 11 years and you've kind of seen this growth. So how do you feel about those comments? Man, they rubbed me the wrong way. Um, Ben is a Hall of Fame quarterback and he has played 18 years in our league, all with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, I was a little bit upset about it because I was always raised to protect the locker room, um, protect the guys. Um, and the way it seems is, and this is my point of view. This is what I see. Um, it looks as though uh, we're looked at as selfish um, uh, players. And I think that's, not the point. I think we have a lot of young players that come from different backgrounds. I think we have guys that um, have experienced different things than what I or somebody else might experience. And that doesn't make them selfish or it doesn't make them more of a me type attitude. Like if you look back at Antonio Brown, 
that guy played through injuries, was triple team, and still, you know, sacrificed his body to, you know, go up and catch the ball. Um, I can talk about uh, Tyson Alwalu, who has never been the guy that fills up the stat sheet, but is so about the team and about, uh, you know, just making sure this is a good locker room. Um, those guys stick out more to me than anything. There are a lot more guys you think that are team first guys than just me type and attitude. Um, I took offense to that. I, I think when you have young guys, it's up to the leadership to step up, myself included. I'm accountable for uh, those guys. And obviously we haven't had a Super Bowl in a long time. And maybe that's where Ben's like, man, if younger guys had grown up, but Man, it's up for the older guys to step up and, you know, hold guys accountable. Um, social media comes. Social media w- wasn't as big when Ben was first coming into this league. But that's nothing we can run from. You embrace it and you learn to be uh, – you learn to continue to just learn f- – to uh, continue to just make your team better. Uh, I think NIL is new to me, and I don't know if it's affected our game yet. But to say we're we're just coddled because of it, I, I don't think that's right. We 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 have a game that we love to play, and guys come from different backgrounds, and some guys need more help than others. But it's up to a, a, a vet to take you on your wing and you know pull you across and say, "Hey, this is what it's like to be a Pittsburgh Steeler," and that's what I'm trying to do. Maybe Ben didn't see it that way, but man, like. I'm going to protect my guys. You're not just – you just can't say that this is a, a me type of attitude now. Everybody's out to, you know, be a, a, a Super Bowl winner. And everybody's out to, you know, make money and one day be an MVP. But when it all comes together, we care about one thing, you know, this logo right here. And when we put that jersey on, we understand we're very fortunate to do it. Um and, you know, we just have to uh, continue to live through that. Um, you guys will hear later on from a guy like Brett Kiesel. I learned from him. I was under his tutelage. And I've always tried to extend that to, you know, my my, my younger teammates. So I, I think Ben was a little, you know, out on that one. Yeah, it almost feels like a generational thing, too. Because, you know, <clears throat> we were saying, you know, before the show that social media wasn't even – really that big of a deal when Ben first came in the league. So of course things are going to be different. And when I saw the social media comment, he said like the, he felt like the game had changed. He felt like the people had changed in a sense. Well, they did because it's a lot more out there now. And I think of a guy like Juju got hurt in the first month or first half of the season last year, tore his shoulder up contract year, came back, did everything he could to play in a playoff game that he didn't have to do. And I do think that's the kind of guy that gets the social media rap. But, dude, he worked his tail off to get healthy and, and really risked a lot of injury to go play for the team. So I, I it's almost like a generational thing it feels like to me. You know, I, I love that you brought up Juju because everybody made such a big stink about social media. But what was he known for? Knocking out a guy from the Bengals, Vontez Burfitt. And everybody appreciated him for that. He didn't have to go and do that. He didn't have to sacrifice his body to go come down and knock Vontez Burfick out. We only looked – there were so many outside factors looking at him as, oh, this guy just likes to have fun. And he should have fun. Like, we are in the time of our lives experiencing this great game. Isn't this game supposed to be fun? <laughs> when did we get away and say, yeah, this is just a business, and, yeah, you should enjoy what you do? Enjoy it. And – you know, for Ben to say that, I, I think Ben forgot that he was a young guy too. Ben, ben used to, you know, go on different things and, you know, obviously they didn't have social media back then, but Ben enjoyed himself as a, as a younger guy. Uh, but it's about connecting with your team and making sure that you have common goals. Did we get the job done all the time? No. But, man, we were a close-knit group. I can't, I can't tell you the amount of guys I hung out with on a Thursday night for treatment night or when we would go to uh, different cities and we would find a restaurant that we would all take part in. Like, that is a close-knit group. That is a team-first group. That is completely different from what Ben said. And so that's why I got kind of upset because I'm like, 
you know, we're approaching camp and I know he had this article coming out, but man, going into camp, I can't wait to be around my guys. I can't wait to just, you know, be around um, Latrobe and understand that we have one common goal to win a Super Bowl. And every other team has that as well. But I think my team can do it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it was just interesting to see him say that so close to camp, too. I mean, I know he said a lot in there about how, like I said, the game had changed. It's not about me. It's about the others. I just had to get your opinion on it because you are a team leader who played with him for over 12 years. So you kind of got to see the newer generation of players that are there now. And you got to deal with him when he wasn't a veteran as much. It, it, it just had to get your opinion on what Ben had to say. I really needed to hear it. And it's not me throwing shade at another person. This is me explaining my side. Through this conversation, uh, I want to make sure I always give anybody the opportunity to, what, clap back, talk back, um, or if you just want to have an open conversation here on Not Just Football, we will provide that platform. I'm not running away from it. You know where I stay. And this applies to not just Ben. This applies to everybody. So don't try to get to say, like, hey, Cam's calling out Ben. Not like that. But I will say I will, pro- I will protect my team. I will make sure that everybody knows that we care only about football on the field and less about off the field. Um, and, you know, I just hope we can all understand that uh, Ben has been a heck of a quarterback. You don't, you don't do this game and become a Hall of Fame quarterback uh, for 18 years and do it at a, a, a low level. Ben has bit, has taken some hits over the years that, you know, not a lot of other teams could do. He's thrown the ball, you know, countless of times. He saved us. He's he's won games that we weren't supposed to win. And he's always stepped up. But it was a team around that helped him do it. And I don't want, want any, anyone to ever forget that the whole team won, not just Ben. Yeah, and that's actually one thing I, I do want to know. With this comes out and a guy who played for the team for so long, is this something that Tomlin or somebody may address early on in camp when, when you guys get there? Or is this something like, it don't man, nobody cares, really? Uh, Mike T, Mr. Rooney, uh, I, I, I doubt they'll make anything out of this. Um, you know, we're single-minded. We have too much football to worry about this. these comments. I was just trying to attack it before we get into, you know, I have to go to camp tomorrow. So, you know, I want to make sure I can plug the Not Just Football podcast uh, and make sure they can get my comments from here. But, uh, you know, it's uh, something that will go by and we'll continue to play football after and he'll continue to get ready for his Hall of Fame speech. Yeah, I would say you need to do that. Anytime you are asked about this, just say, hey, the episode's coming out, Not Just Football with Cam Hayward. I'm going to address everything on there. It, that's where my answer will be. You need to you need to go full Draymond on this. <laughs> and I will. The, you yeah. can count on that. Uh, I know okay. some of my uh, media counterparts are pro- probably going to be a little ticked off. But, man, hey, we need your views. So like and subscribe and make sure you watch the Not Just Football podcast with Cam Hayward. All right. We have a special guest, guys. My friend, my mentor, someone I've always looked up to. I call my Obi-Wan. He's taught me so much. A two-time Super Bowl winner. A pro bowler, you better know his nickname, The Beard, Brett Kiesel, is here today. Appreciate you coming on, Keys. Oh, my gosh. I'm so happy to be here with you and Hayden. Congratulations on your show, bro. Yeah, shoot. I had to have you on. You, you've made me look good too many times, so I got to count on you again. You probably give me too much credit, bro. You probably do. Uh you know, but I'm honored to be on your show. I'm honored to still get to watch you play after all these years and watch you dominate. Uh, you never get pushed around, and you're such a staple for us black and gold fans today. So keep up the good work, pal. I appreciate that. All right, we're, we're going to jump right in. So you've always been a mentor to me, and I thank you for that. And we got all these new guys on the team. I think we only have like 30 guys who have been to training camp before at Latrobe. <laughs> what would you say to the new guys coming on? Well, first off, they've kind of won the lottery getting selected to be and wear the black and gold. Um, if you've never been to Latrobe, if you've never 
you know, seeing a game at Akershire Stadium, uh, then you don't know what's going on. But, um, you know, it's a special place. Pittsburgh bleeds black and gold. And uh, it's kind of like a religion here. Uh, it's something that has a strong foundation, something that has great history. And when you when you become a part of it, you know, it's really special. Uh, I was fortunate that I got to play my whole career here. But talking to guys that have played elsewhere and stuff understand how special Pittsburgh is. Um, we have ownership that comes and eats with us every day. It hangs out with us every day. It flies to all of our games and is is a is an image, a physical image, every in everything you do. And it stems down just like that through the front office. So it's a unique environment, and don't waste your opportunity. All right, you said you Cam said you were his mentor. Take us back to 2011. First time you meet Cam, first impressions, and what made you think, all right, I got to take this guy under my wing and teach him how the ropes work? Well, I remember when we drafted him, I was watching the draft, and, you know, Coach Tomlin kept telling me for years that I was leaking oil. So I kind of figured (laughs) that someone was going to be getting, you know, a high pick to maybe replace me. And, um, you know, they picked Cam, and – and uh, he came into training camp, and my first impressions were that this this guy is really big. He's really strong. He's really physical. Uh, I always remember one of our first days in pads in Latrobe. You know, we got lined up for a nine on seven drill, and someone like kept pushing Cam in the back after the play was over, like hanging on to him and pushing him. And, Cam didn't really know any better at the time. He didn't want to ruffle any feathers. Uh, But he came to the sidelines, and I just whispered in his ear, if you let him push you in the back, they will never stop. You better stand up for yourself. Well, (laughs) Cam got in a fight the the very next play, and he's pretty much been fighting in training camp ever since. So he's uh, (laughs) – You know, just been a great guy to come in and one of those guys that put his head down and went to work. And and anytime you asked him to do something, he would always show up and do it. He's he's very involved in the community. You know, he's just a he's a special guy and a special pick. Don't do that. Don't don't make it seem like it's my funeral. and We have to hype me up a little bit. We're not we're not here for me. We're here for you. No, we're, he asked me a question, man. Can I answer the question? <laughs> and I appreciate him mentioning the fighting because you are known. Every time I get an update from Bleach Report, it'd be like you're fighting somebody. So I'm glad Brett confirmed that he did fight everybody in camp. I usually don't start it, but I do finish it. How about that? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> That's true. All right. So, you know, you spoke about mentorship. Who was a guy that mentored you and, you know, took you under their wing when you came into the league? Yeah, so I was fortunate to have Aaron Smith and Kimo Von Olhoff, and they were the two starting defensive ends. I was a little bit shocked uh, coming into a professional environment that these guys would help me, you know, because essentially I'm vying for their job and I'm trying to, you know, work my way into any type of rotation. Um, I think that's something that's really unique about Pittsburgh. You know, the veterans help the younger guys and they try and and teach them the Steeler way and teach them how we do business uh, down there on the south side. And um, so Aaron and Kimo were huge for me. They would help me after practice. They kind of showed me, you know, the ropes and, and were there for me when When everyone else is kind of walking up to the locker room, walking up the hill in the trove, we were hitting sleds and they're teaching me how to roll my hips and they're teaching me how to shoot my hands and play with extension and keep the guy locked out. Because I don't know if you know this, but offensive linemen hold every play. So you got (laughs) to have some technique. You got to have a little bit of swagger to your game and some tricks. And what better than to have, you know, veteran guys show you as a young guy and those guys really took me under their wing and helped me and you know they showed me it's important and that's why like with cam and ziggy and steve and all those guys that were young when i was kind of you know working my way out uh it was important to me to be that same type of mentor to them dude i I think you got to talk about what did 
Coach Mitch. Like, what was your impression of Coach Mitch? And, like, how was his impression oh. of, like, on your career? Well, when I first got in, Mitch was really hard on me. Uh, and he was just hard on young guys. You know, he really wanted to test you and see how mentally tough you were, what you could handle. There wasn't a lot of good jobs, you know, a lot of pats on the back and nice play or anything like that throughout my first four years, really. It was, you got to do this better. You got to have extension. You got to get your feet right. He's constantly coaching. Um, But as you gradually start to play, as he gradually starts to trust you and see that he can rely on you, you know, that relationship changes. And um, he... He's one of those guys where I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to play under Mitch, you know, especially after hearing about his history and and where he came from and being, you know, the first black player to play at Alabama under Bear Bryant and then being the first black coach. And, I mean, it's just such an honor to be able to play for someone like that that's really, you know, seen some tough times and seen some real adversity and, he kind of coached like that. He coached like Bear Bryant, I think. And, you know, he was very stern. He was very tough. But but now is one of the softest, kindest guys I know and someone who, you know, I would jump in front of a train for in a heartbeat. I'm so grateful for him. You know, I'm so grateful for his leadership and, 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 and the things he taught me and the toughness that he he taught me how to play with, you know, football is a brutal sport and it's so mentally grueling and, and physical that you guys that come in and they're just great specimens and strong guys or whatever, they don't last. You've got to be mentally tough. You've got to be mentally strong. And, and I think that's how Mitch coach was like, I'm going to break this guy down to the bare minimum. And if he can handle it, I know I'll be able to, to count on him in the fourth quarter. Well, shoot, Keys, I remember, like, the first time I was in the meeting with y'all, and, like, you know how Mitch talks. Like, he doesn't call rookies by their names. He calls them by their numbers. So I was 97. And, you know, he starts talking, and he's like, man, I got my playmakers. I got 99. I got 98. I got 91. The rest of you suckers, you're fighting for special teams. <laughs> That was true. The rest of you guys, you better – I mean, I remember when I was young, Mitch was like, hey, Key, hey, he didn't sit calm keys. I messed up right there. Hey, 99. I was like, yeah. He goes, you been to Walmart? And I said, yeah. You need me to pick you up something? He's like, yeah. You should probably pick up a job application while you're over there next because there's no way you're going to make this team. <laughs> okay. I think we need John Mitchell as a guest on the show. I mean, geez. you got to get him. Man, that sounds we like the next get him. Yeah, He's really rough right. on the young guys, like like Cam yeah. said. You know, he he would tell him straight up, you going to take his job? You take a 99 job? No. You going to take 98's job? No. You going to take 91's job? No. You take a 76's job? No. So there isn't a job here for you guys, but you're trying out for 31 <laughs> other teams, okay? So you better work. <laughs> uh like i love mitch to death and i i attribute a lot of you know what i've done today because of him like even when we we study film now i'm like damn the way mitch would have coached us i'm like this is a mi- this is a minus like i remember because i used to live like three houses or three doors down from mitch and he would sl- like i was sick one day he slid all my mistakes underneath my my uh door and was like 97 you still don't get the damn day off (laughs) bro when we used to come in the building mitch would be waiting for us after a game he'd be waiting there you know and you think you'd come in you'd be like good morning mitch how you doing well you had about 15 me's in the game i'm not doing too good you shouldn't be doing too good either i'm like geez can i get my foot through the door (laughs) But okay. you know what? It was so fun in that room, in the D-line room, you know, because we had Big Hamp, who was, who was really Mitch's, you know, golden child. Hamp yeah. could do no wrong. He was his right. first-round pick. He was, you know, whatever case he did. And so, you know, sometimes during meetings, like, we'd be middle of the season or something, and Hamp would always sit next to me and, 
you know, Hampa starts snoring. <laughs> <laughs> and Mitch would be like, he'd blame me. He'd be like, 99, you better wake up, Hamp. I'm like, geez, man, Casey, get up. What? You know? <laughs> It was Bro. awesome. I I loved every minute of going to work. You know, it was a great, great time. Back to you. Coming in as a seventh rounder, how did you feel the best way was for you to get on the field? There was only one way, according to Mitch. You don't have a job on the D-line. So it was like, man, I got to run down the field on kickoff and special teams and that that was the only place I saw myself getting a job. So uh, I focused on that really when I was a young player. I focused on all my special teams. Obviously, you know, I wanted to get better on defense, but I really felt like I could go out and be dominant on special teams and stand out on special teams. So when going into my first training camp, you know, anytime I got a chance to go against a starter – because uh, we were matchstick men, right? Wearing the red hats, you look at the card, you do what's on the card. But any time I had a chance to go against the starter, I tried to dog him, and uh, and then just fly to the ball, like. And and I know you guys still do that today, run to the ball like crazy. You know that was a huge mantra of mine, just fly into the ball as fast as I could, let my wheels do my talking, and and then let the chips fall where they may. But when we got into games and I'm going against like, you know, linebackers or tight ends or, you know, even secondary type dudes, I just pick those guys up and launch them and down the trail you go, you know, so we're good. Or, And that was back in the days when they had the wedge, you know, you had to be a wedge buster. So when I forget things and people ask me questions, I'm like, I used to hit the wedge. I I don't know. <laughs> That's the crazy thing. Like I started off on special teams too. I was part of the wedge for kickoff return. Yeah, I hated it, but they yeah, always well, do it. We got that rule changed, so there's no more wedge, right? Yeah. Too many concussions. Old. Is that what it was? Yeah. Too many concussions. Too many you know war stories because of that. Well, one of my first games. I remember I come down and I blast this guy on the wedge, like knock him out cold. And Cower, Cower used to watch game film on Saturday before the game. And so he put that play up and he's like, okay, okay, okay. Good job, Keith. And then he's like, but watch this one. So the very next kickoff, I go running down and hit the next guy that they brought in and knock myself out. <laughs> and I'm trying to get off the field and I get I'm running sideways and then I like fall over and uh Cower's like, Yeah, sometimes you get the bear, sometimes the bear gets you, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't just you on like special teams too, right? Like it was, you know, Debo, James Harrison was on special teams, Ike was on punt, like it was like a you uh, write a passage. You had to be on special teams before you got to play on defense. Yeah, back in the day, that's where you got your start on special teams. Um, you know, Cower kind of ha you had to work your way into a starting role, even if you were a first round pick or whatever, or top five, five five rounds or whatever. You had to start on special teams. Troy started on special teams. Um, I mean, we had a great special teams unit, which is so critical in the game. Uh, if your special teams is lacking, you can easily lose the game. So it's important to be stout and strong in all three phases. And, and you know, I think that's why you see, especially now, like when people get into playoff situations and stuff, you see a lot of starters playing in some of those special teams roles because – the margin for error is so small in winning and losing in the NFL that you need some dogs out there that are yeah. that are willing to go crazy. Yeah. So, like, do you think that's how you gain your teammates' trust and respect for the most part? For sure. I know that I stood out in that regard. Like, if you ran the tape, you could see me stride for stride with some of the skill position guys and 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 – you know, it's all special teams is all about effort and want to. And 
and it's it's you one guy is going to make the play you know you got one chance and if you're only playing special teams you maybe get 10 chances a game and that's a lot so we had a really healthy competition with Debo and Clint Crewalt and Cheedy and Sean Morey and all these guys that were kind of special teams dudes like we had a real healthy competition to make the play and um it was hard to make the play but it only made us better well you know we talked about special teams but i think we got to get to the defense and we got to talk about that number one defense you were part of like the 2008 defense was i think is one of the greatest of all time like anytime i see that picture i'm like those dudes were all my teachers like they taught me so much and like they kicked a whole lot of ass doing it and how does it feel to be part of that group oh it feels so great to look in the rear view and and have you know the type of accolades we have to to have kicked as much ass in the afc north that we did um and you know have an opportunity to go and play in the biggest stage three times and bring a couple of those home. Uh, and then to look back and have our numbers. I remember LeBeau during the course of that year going, you know, I don't know if these numbers are ever be broken again because he could see the game starting to change. He could see, you know, the rules starting to change to where you can't hit quarterbacks and you can't hit anyone coming across the middle. And, you know, back in, Back in the day, why Heinz Ward was so valuable is because he'd go across the middle and make that catch and someone would pop him right in the face and he'd get up and smile at him and, and point for the first down. I mean, the game was a little bit different. I don't know how you guys play defense today, Cam. I don't know how you get a quarterback. I don't know how you get sacks because I'm glad we got to play back then when, when you could be physical and you could be uh, a little violent. and. That was definitely, you know, a catalyst for our success was playing physical and forcing teams out of the run, forcing teams to pass, and then just unleashing LeBeau's blitz packages, you know? Uh, Brett, I got to ask about that, though. That 2008 team, I cannot talk about that team without the James Harrison play in the Super Bowl. Give me your perception of the convoy that went down the field and that, and what do you remember from that? How dead were you running through that? Please just take me through that. Well, luckily there was a timeout before that play, so we all got to catch our breath. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was a really instinctual play by James. Um, you know, he and Troy were very instinctual players, but – but to, it was an all-out blitz, you know, and, and James pulled back and Kurt threw it right into his chest. And you can hear the audio during the game if you listen real close, me yelling at Debo, let's go, Debo! And we just take off, you know, and it was something that we practice all the time, uh, change of possession and, and really flipping – the score sheet. I mean, that was a 14 point swing in that game. And really the reason we won the game was because of that play. So uh, just a huge play. I remember getting out in front of everyone and then being like, okay, hey, what am I going to do now? There's no one around. All right. I, I need to look back and I don't know who it was, but, but he hit, he and I hit pretty good. And and it just seemed like every time someone was about to take him, another Steeler would make a block. Woodley made a big block. Uh, Ryan Clark, Deshaies blocking Kurt there, Ike. Um, it was just our mentality when we got the ball to score. And, and uh, man, I'm glad James took it to the crib in that play. <laughs> yeah, he about had an asthma attack after that, right? <laughs> yeah, he was dying. I mean, you know. <laughs> Uh, that was a long way to go and and such a gritty play, such an effort play. I look back to, you know, Larry Fitzgerald comes off the sidelines and makes that swipe. And, I mean, it's just amazing that that ball didn't come out and James kept possession and it was across the line. And John Madden's last call, uh, you know, his last game that he got to call. So it has all those fuzzy feelings to it. <laughs> like, I think it's got to be like, one of the best, if not the best game, like, in Super Bowl history. Like, I, the amount of things that happened in that game are crazy. 
I think so. I mean, and that play has my vote for best play ever. Uh, just because, and, and James says like the immaculate reception is the best play ever. And then that play, but I, I look at that play and I just look at how many, uh, how many factors went into that play and how many guys rallied and how many guys, you know, found work to do. And, um, that's what makes a great defense. It's, it's you and 10 other guys finding work to do and holding yourself accountable and, and being where you need to be. Um, and, and that's what was special that year. It just seemed like uh, we were all kind of veterans. We kind of knew the system. We knew what we were capable of. And when we would play teams like, you know, and hold teams to 100 yards and stuff like that, it, it was for total offense, it was just like mind-boggling, you know, like how could we do that? But But history says we did. <laughs> So out of all the Super Bowls you, you've played in, right, which one will you never forget? You know, 05, 08, or 2011? Well, I've already tried to forget about the third one. Uh, it's And that it's crazy because even when I put my rings on, you know, I could see my second place watch right there. <laughs> and I'm just like. Dude, I remember when you guys got those watches, right? You guys got those watches when we were in meetings, and everybody got them, and you guys were like, "You guys, excuse my language." You guys were like, "Screw that! We're not, we're not taking those those watches. Like they're second place. We'll be back." Yeah, we did. We thought we'd have another chance, but it is so tough to get there. Um, but it took me a long time to try and get over that game. Uh, it, you know to get there and to win it and to know what that feels like to win it and, and everything that comes after that, you know, and I think we were all ready for that third kind of staple in, in, in our legacy. And it just wasn't meant to be. I mean, uh, Aaron and, and Green Bay played phenomenally and, and we just couldn't seem to get over the hump. We had a bad start. But my favorite is 43. I think just the ebbs and flows of that game and, um, you know, the emotion we felt during that game, the high emotion going into halftime after Debo ran it back and then coming out and 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 they moved the ball some and scored and then took the lead. And it was like, what is happening? No, this can't be real. You know, and you just – all that emotion sets in and, and then – Ben takes it down and throws to San Antonio. He makes the toe tap grab there, and we had to go out and make a stop. You know, there was a little over a minute left on the field, which is plenty of time, you know, for a team to go down and score. And so was, I'm grateful we were able to go out there and Woodley stripped him and it fell right in my lap. And I still, you know, I still go down and grab that ball every now and then, pet it a little bit. And, <laughs> give it some love and i'm grateful for it you know it's probably my favorite super bowl 40 i was so wound up being in the first one like i kind of didn't even really enjoy it i sat in my room the whole time i was studying i was focused i was just like we got to win this game and uh i think i eased up a little bit more as as i got to be a starter and as uh as i got a, a little bit more confidence in my game hmm. All right, so we've been talking about greatness. We got to talk about the greatness in your beard. Like, <laughs> for sure. why, did, why did you grow it? And who gave you the name The Beard? <laughs> well, I grew it kind of on a whim. Uh, my wife was pregnant with our second child in 2010. And uh, so I started growing my hair out for good luck because it was leaving. So I'm like, <laughs> man, if I'm going to... If I'm gonna if I'm gonna ever grow my hair out, now is the time. So yeah. I started growing my hair out, and uh, I just felt like it needed an accessory a little bit. Uh, so I just quit shaving. Part of it was superstition. The year before, the Penguins, Pittsburgh Penguins, had won the Stanley Cup, and I watched these guys grow their playoff beards and how grizzly they looked and how you know, much of a fan I was of that. I was like, I got to try that. And uh, so I started growing it out, went to training camp with long beard and 
longer hair. And and then I just kind of said, you know, if we keep winning, I'm going to keep letting it go. And, and we certainly did. We just kept winning. We kept winning. And uh, about midway through the season or when we got into the fall, you know, I'll never forget Mr. Dan Rooney came down through the locker room and, and I was kind of just coming out of the shower. I went to my locker and he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, with all that, like all that, what's going on? And I was like, Mr. Rooney, if this bothers you, if, if you don't think this is a good look for your team, if you don't think, you know, that you like it, trust me, I'll get the Clippers right now. He's like, oh, no, no, I, I actually like it a lot. I, you remind me of Santa Claus. And uh, <laughs> you know, so I think you should keep it going. And and uh, anyway, we went all the way to the Super Bowl that year. And we ended up not winning. But that's how I came up with Sheer to Beard. I wanted to do something special for the fans. Uh, you know, just kind of tell them thanks for all the support they gave us throughout the year. And then and then my mentor, Aaron Smith's son, was fighting leukemia at the time. So I wanted to do something that would help those kids that, that are going through that fight and show them that I had their back. And, and we started Sheer to Beard. And, you know, we did it, did that for a decade. And it's just kind of become a trademark of mine. You know, people that see me when I'm clean cut or fresh shaven, they're disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> they don't recognize you. We, yeah, they want that look. They want the beard, and so I've been uh, I've been growing it out a little bit again, and you know, getting food all over in it again. So, but it's definitely been a huge blessing of mine, and and I think something that Steeler fans can can get behind and and rally. Well, like out, we were researching this, right? And like, you must have gave some BS answer, and you were like, "Yeah, the NFL needs more character." <laughs> and I'm like, like Kiesel's got all the character. Why does NFL need more characters? Like, so like yeah, now I remember we, that. I remember that someone I think asked me why I was growing that up, growing it out. I think I was a little shocked that you know, because when I grew it, I can't remember someone having a huge beard like that. That they kind of let it grow throughout the whole year. I didn't. There wasn't anyone that stuck out to mind to me. So I think I said something like, yeah, the NFL needs more lunatics or something. And <laughs> okay, so like post-career life, right? You know, where the hell have you been? Like, where have you been hiding? I, I've seen you, but nobody else has seen you. Like, I, I heard, like, this is one of the first interviews you've done in a very long time. Yeah, I don't do a ton of interviews. I don't do a lot of media stuff. Um you know, I really, when I got done, I really wanted to focus on my family. They have been so supportive of me and, and uh, had had followed me throughout my whole career. I thought it was kind of about time to try and, and be a good dad and be home and be able to take my kids to their sporting events and, you know, go to their school concerts and, and just be there, be available. Uh, so I chose to kind of do this route. You know, I had opportunities to coach and and to get into some media and stuff like that. But I just chose to kick back a little bit uh, for this, you know, 15 years or so that, that I'm going to have with my wife and I raising our family. Um, I can't be idle. I can't sit still. I have to be I have to be moving. I have to have a schedule. I have to have things to do. So I started Mighty Oak Adventures um, and it's essentially a leadership leadership company that Michelle Rosenthal and I started and uh, we we do a lot of executive trips and corporate trips where we take people fishing and we take people whitewater rafting and shooting and uh, get people outside their comfort zone a little bit but out into the woods and it's really been awesome um, you know to have that opportunity I bought a farm you know, a lot of people have, have shown love to my farm and my cows. And so it's, I'm just trying to live one dream after the next, bro. That's people ask me what I'm doing. I just say, I'm living the dream, man. Yeah. 
Okay, so like you have these longhorns on your property at your farm, and you got one named Dick LeBull, and I know you got one named Debo. Why the heck don't I have a longhorn named after me? That's a good question. Um, you will eventually. <laughs> it's up to the fans, Cam. You know, okay. I, I throw it out to the fans on social media. The fans are the one that came up with Dick LeBull. The fans came up with bull cower. Uh, (laughs) The fans came up with horns ward. So what, what type of name do you think would go good with you? I mean, you have Hayward, but yeah, that's good. But do you want it to be like they're eating Hayward or what? I don't know about that, but like, it's got to be fitting. The the Longhorns got to have a big head. It's got to have a big head first. The big longhorn. head. It's got to have a like a giant size head for it to be him. It's got to be. It's, if you're Cal or whoever gets one, giant head, it's Cam. That's who it is. All right. Don't worry. You'll definitely get one named after you, buddy. <laughs> I got to knock some of those guys out first. Did you see the I name know. I gave the last one or actually the fans made? No, I haven't seen Did this. Did you see that one? This one no. is a classic. Fuamatu Muafala. <laughs> okay. That one's not getting topped. That's the best one so far. That's the best one. That's so, it. So, yeah, we got Fuamatu Muafala. We're going to call it Fumu for short. But, yeah, it's so fun. I mean, I've enjoyed putting things like that out to the fans. They They love being creative and coming up with funny names. So, We'll definitely try and get you in there, buddy. Don't worry. <laughs> I'll be okay, I think. <laughs> well, last question. As we approach training camp, give me some advice for me and the defense going forward. Ooh, all right. Well, buddy, my advice to you would be to enjoy it. Enjoy every moment. You know, this is 12 for you, isn't it? It is. It's 12. Yeah. So my advice would be to get your family up there, have your boys come up and spend the night with you and take them around the trove and get them, you know, kind of the back backstage pass there and take them to meetings. If, if coach Tom was still cool with that, I mean, AB's kids used to come into meetings and San Antonio's kids used to interrupt meetings. So I would say, <laughs> You know, get them involved and get them in there because I have, you know, I have pictures. Well, I got a picture right here with my kids up there staying with me. And uh, I don't know if you can see that with the reflection, but they grow up fast, buddy. They grow up fast. And get your family up there and and, uh, really enjoy it. But on the business side, just hold people accountable, bro, like you always have. You know, force them to play up to your level. Don't play down to anyone else's level. Bring the team up like you always have been and the great leader that you always have been. And get your other guys that are, you know, yard dogs with you holding the same code. You know, when when everyone's together and everyone's focused and especially your leadership core is focused, the sky's the limit. Those young guys will follow you and they'll, they'll want to be, they want to be just like you guys and do what you guys are doing. So, and weed out the garbage, man. Don't let garbage infiltrate your team and and infiltrate the business that you're about to go about. And, uh, you know, you got a fresh start this year with kind of new quarterback, something new. Um, It's going to be different, but, one thing that's going to remain the same is you and the defense and going out there and ho- keeping people from scoring points to give the Steelers a chance to win. Highest paid defense, by the way, Brett. Highest paid defense in the league this year. So he's got some pressure on him. Wow, highest yeah. paid. Is that real? He hates that, he he hates that paid stat. Defense? He hates that really. stat, but that's true. It we were the sad. lowest paid back in 2008. <laughs> so I don't know how much hope I have for you guys. No, I'm just kidding. You guys will be great. I, uh, what are you, how are you feeling about it, Cam? Are you a little nervous? Are you excited? When do you, when do you report? Well, it's Monday today and man, I'm looking forward to it. You know, we start camp tomorrow, got the conditioning test, but, um, man, it, it, like you said, new quarterback, new, new, new things happening. 
but the defense got to be, you know, the constant. And I'm, I'm gearing up for this. Like, it, it's a new challenge that we get to conquer. And I, I keep telling everybody, I feel like we're the black hat. Like, nobody wants us to be there, but I, we're going to force our way there. And that's the way I like it. Well, you guys have really been, you know, a reason you've been successful up to this point. Uh, I can't say enough about you and TJ and how you guys play up front and, uh, and the demeanor of what you play with and stuff. It's it's awesome being someone who sometimes wishes they could get back out there and play sometimes to be able to turn the TV on and watch you guys dog people. I love <laughs> it. I mean, I just love it. And I, sh- you know, tell my kids and stuff who, who really don't like watching football games with me because I still kind of turn into a little bit of a lunatic. <laughs> but I'm just like, you know, watch these guys and watch how they work and, and watch what they do when their back's against the wall. And watch how they rise up to the occasion. And, you know, you guys haven't disappointed me much. So it's been a lot of fun. And and uh, how many – do you, where, you get – uh two rooms there in Latrobe now that you're you're a 12 year veteran or what when do you uh how many things you rent you know a king size bed and a fridge and the big screen tv you playing video games in there what are you doing uh I gotta catch up on some movies I've never watched Top Gun before so that's one of my goals during camp you've never seen Top Gun no (laughs) okay it's all right did you see the second one? No, I want to see the second one, so I got to watch the first one. Okay, yeah, you're gonna to want to be a fighter pilot after you watch that. But Brett, I want to say I appreciate you coming on today. I appreciate you, you know, dropping some knowledge, sharing your your you know adventures, you know your trials, you know your your moments at the top. Man, I appreciate you, dude. You know, you've always been a mentor to me um, and, you know, can't wait to see what you're doing next. Uh, thank you, guys. It's an honor to be on here with you guys and in, in your new show. And I know the show is going to be great and um, just finish strong, buddy. And, you know, let the chips fall where they may. I know you and you're going to give it everything you have. And that's why not only me, but, you know, all of Steeler Nation loves you. So. Keep it up, and I look forward to seeing what you boys are going to do down there at Acrisure this year. <laughs> you like the name? <laughs> <laughs> and that's Thank how we you. end it. Not- <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I Thank do you. like the name. I understand the business aspect of it. Uh, I understand all that. Uh, and and I understand that I don't ever have to say that when I'm talking about stories from my days. Everything that that we did happened at Heinz Field. And so when I tell stories, you know, I know I've used that name a few times today, but when I tell stories about what we did, you can better believe it's going to be at Heinz Field. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Brad, but it's cool. I mean, things change. Yeah, thank you, buddy. Thank you. Nice to see you, Hayden. Good to see you too. You ask any questions, but maybe next time you'll get to talk a little bit. Okay. Hoping to. Hoping to. This is going to be a one-time thing. I promise that. Like, we're going to have to bring you back on. There's plenty of stories you can tell. Okay. All right. I'd love to come back on. Appreciate Give you. me on mid-season, all right? So I'm going to have right. a few notes and some stuff that I have some questions for you. Perfect. Mid-season. Hell yeah. Let's it's do it. Brett and John Mitchell. That's who's coming on next. They're coming on together to really oh, critique that would the be game. Awesome. Midway yeah. through the season, we're going to critique the game. That's oh, what I want. Man. Oh, man. Yeah, give me Hamp and Mitch, and we yeah. will light this stage up like the 4th of July. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Love it. All right. That is a wrap on our show today. I thought we had a heck of a show having Brett Kiesel on, my mentor. Um, He dropped some knowledge. He shared some stories. Man, I feel smarter because of it, but I got a lot of work to do. Hayden, how did you think we did? I thought we did good, man. Excited and uh, good luck at camp. Yeah. 
camp is here now. I can't believe we finally gotten to a point where camp is right around the corner. Going back to Latrobe finally. It's gonna be fun. Everybody, listen to the show. We're gonna still be kicking it at Latrobe for the Not Just Football podcast. Make sure you like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>